Hi everyone, um, hope we're all good. Oh, I'll probably put these on. Might make the sound a bit better. Hope everyone's well. Sorry I missed last week. Um, I had a few things on with work so I couldn't um, do the live. So welcome back. Um, there's quite a few questions this week actually, so I'll get straight on with them. Um, I've sort of jumbled the order of them a bit because I think some of them sort of clump together quite nicely to cover off specific topics. Um, one person has put, when I'm trying to stop drinking, I comfort eat in its place and it's always takeaway food I want, which is no good for the waistline or wallet. Have you got any helpful strategies to help overcome this? And perhaps some explanation why I, f why I feel the need for food or alcohol every night. Any advice would be great. Um, so, and then I'll read out actually the first comment on the post, which is, um, I keep myself super busy, really does help. Lots of walking, any kind of exercise. Didn't do dwelling on the past, staring at the four, four walls, keep your mind busy. So I think that's a really good answer as well to the question. And I think the point there is um, when we're drinking, we tend to get very used to taking something and consuming it to change how we're feeling. Um, and it tends to, because it's a sedative, it's our main way of coping with stress. So what we quite often do, if you just quit drinking without having any kind of other plan in place you can sometimes just end up reaching for the next thing to, con to consume to change how you feel. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people, when they do quit, they tend to eat rather a lot or they, you know, they may smoke more or drink more coffee or whatever. Um, so I think, so I've said this several times, but I think for me, one of the best coping strategies is actually exercise um, because it is fairly difficult to do too much of it. Um, it's not... You know, like with overeating, you're going to put on weight and you, it's frustrating as well, overeating. It's not pleasurable. Eating when you're hungry is a pleasure. Eating when you're not hungry is pretty unpleasant and frustrating. Um, so that's for me personally, what I do is um, exercise. I find it really useful. Um, the other thing I would say is um, on the one hand, when you quit drinking, you shouldn't be afraid of life. You shouldn't think, oh, I can't go out and socialise, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do the other, because there'll be drinking or drinkers there. Um, so you should go out and face life, but then equally there's no point doing stuff that only ever revolved around drinking. So if a load of people are going out purely to drink and drink lots, it's probably going to be a lot less interesting for you and you might want to actually miss it, not because you're going to go and you're going to drink, but because it holds no interest for you. Uh, hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but then also translate that into if you're the kind of person who every evening opens a bottle of wine and just sits in front of the telly watching whatever is on. OK, because if you're doing that, don't forget alcohol is a sedative. It dumbs you down. If you're drinking, you can sit and watch any old rubbish on the TV and it will probably entertain you because in your sedated state, it's enough to keep you entertained and interested. OK, when you're not drinking, it's unlikely to. So if you go home and sit on front of the TV and put the rubbish on, but you're not drinking, you're probably not going to find it particularly interesting. OK, so to a degree, you do need to change your lifestyle. You're changing your lifestyle because you're not drinking and you will need to change other aspects of it. So I used to find when I was drinking, I was quite happy to just sit in front of the TV and watch anything. Whereas now I struggle to watch the TV. I just don't find it particularly engaging most of the time. So if you are that kind of person, find something else to do of an evening, you know, maybe read a book or join an online club or something. There's, there's a whole world of things out there you can do even in lockdown and lockdown starting to be released now anyway. So stuff you can do, especially in summer months, to get out and actually do stuff. Um, someone else put, I'm an obsessive compulsive type person, but in all the wrong ways. My drinking, smoking, buying stuff I don't need. I'm wondering if many people that suffer from addiction have similar personality traits. Although I haven't started yet, I'm thinking of becoming obsessive about health and well-being. And hopefully that'll help kick out my bad habits. Well, I think that ties into what I was just talking about. Um, becoming obsessed with health and well-being is probably a good thing to be obsessed about anyway. So I wouldn't worry too much about that if that's your concern. But talking more generally about personality types, what I would say is 
every personality type is like a double-edged sword okay it has a good side and a bad side so for example if you're a risk taker okay some people will see that as bad because you're doing whatever you're doing constantly taking risks but don't forget it's the people who take the risks that tend to achieve the most um, so if you're an obsessive compulsive person another word for that is thorough Okay, people who aren't obsessive or compulsive tend to be messy, not only in, you know, their habits, but just generally the way I think about things. So all of these personality types have good and bad points. And even being obsessive and compulsive is not a bad thing. So I'm a lawyer at the moment. Loads of people in law are obsessive and compulsive, and I am to a degree. And it's what makes a good lawyer because you're looking at every single aspect. You take nothing for granted. You're checking the wording of absolutely everything. You go right back to the beginning on everything. And that's what makes good lawyers. Um, and I was previously in the military as well as most of you know. And again, that makes a good soldier. If you're the kind of person that everything has to be exact all the time, that is what makes a good soldier. And it's not just about looking smart. It's about making, making sure that all your kit's in the right place. It's in good working order and all the rest of it. So I think you're absolutely right. If you're an obsessive compulsive person and you're focusing that towards drinking and smoking and buying stuff you don't need, then yes, that's negative. And going back to the previous comments, if you're you know, concentrating on overeating or whatever it is, again, that's going to be entirely negative. Um, but yes, put it into health and well-being. That would be a fantastic thing to do. Um, the next topic. So there was a few questions here. Um, which I think was really interesting. So I'll read out all the different questions on this one topic. I've kind of clumped them together because I think it covers the same point. Um, somebody said maybe something about FOMO. So FOMO is the fear of missing out. So when you quit drinking, you've got this constant feeling that everyone else is having a great life and you're missing out on it. Somebody else put in day 60 today. So well done. That's fantastic. It's amazing. But I'm constantly worried how I'm going to maintain this in the long term. Can you please talk about this again? Thanks. Someone else put complacency danger zone. How to keep the reasons you've quit live and fresh. Someone else has put, I want to get to a place where I never want to drink. I'm nearly four months sober and usually fail at this point. Please tell me if I keep going, I'll eventually lose the all desire to drink. I'm okay most of the time now, but just sometimes I romanticise about a drink. I know it's probably fab, FAB, fading effect bias. Um, someone else has put always... Uh, attach more pleasure to not drinking than drinking it tricks you then it tries its best to destroy you so all of these things what they're about they're about feeling like you're missing out okay so you're constantly thinking about it you're thinking about how wonderful it is but then I've got another question here which I think is fantastic how do you deal with regret when you realize you didn't actually live any experience fully for the past 20 years now, the reason I think that question is fantastic is because look at the difference in mindset between those two. You've got a group of people afraid that they're missing out because they're not drinking. But then you've got someone there who recognises that actually they missed out when they were drinking. OK, so keep this in mind. Alcohol is a sedative. If you have fear of missing out or you think you're missing out on something, you still have this magic potion, this magic elixir view of alcohol, that it somehow makes everything perfect and wonderful. It's a sedative. It anaesthetizes you. It leaves you feeling half asleep. OK, so whatever you are doing, whether you are socialising, whether you're watching sport, whatever it is, if you're drinking, you're not experiencing it fully. It's not the drinker, it's not the non-drinker who is missing out. It's not we who have quit drinking that are missing out. It's the drinkers who are missing out because they're constantly half sedated. OK, you cannot fully appreciate the world or enjoy it when you are drinking because it is a sedative. So get your head buried in reality and take it out of the clouds. OK, because this... This is what feeds into the problem. It's this nonsensical view that alcohol is suddenly this magic elixir. Remember what it is. It's a chemical sedative. OK, there's no more to it than that. It's like taking a mild dose of morphine or heroin okay, and just feeling slightly more dulled. The reason we have these ideas of it being an elixir of life is because as it wears off, it leaves you anxious and afraid. So when you drink regularly, 
you get into that ridiculous, horrible mindset where you need it to relax and you need it to feel good because what you're actually doing is removing that unpleasant anxiety created by the previous drinking. But what feeds into that, when we socialise, our brain releases endorphins and we feel really, really happy. We just feel relaxed and really good. Um, So we're also creatures of society, okay? So when we're out with other people, we feel slightly nervous. We're worried about saying something stupid or what they think of us. So when you go to a social function, there is an initial period of nerves before you start to relax and these endorphins are released, okay? If you're very shy, it takes longer. If you're fairly extrovert, then it will happen quicker, but it happens that way for everyone. Alcohol being a sedative anaesthetizes that feeling of nerve so you get the endorphin rush slightly earlier okay that's all it does alcohol does not make you feel happy there's no alcohol high the alcohol high is either the relieving of the previous withdrawal pangs or it is the fe- removing the nerves that are preventing you momentarily from getting that endorphin rush and in fact when you follow the evening on most of the time, if you watch drinkers, they'll have a period of an hour or so where they do look happy and that's the endorphin rush kicking in. And then after that, it tends to calm down and they become a bit maudlin or argumentative or tired. And what they've actually done there is anaesthetise the endorphins. So whereas the non-drinker will enjoy the entire evening, the drinker tends to only enjoy the first part of it. And then, of course, they have the disturbed sleep and the anxiety the next day. OK, So that's what I would say to that point. It's about reality, okay? This isn't about looking at it in a clever way or trying to trick yourself to not want something that you actually do want. It's the complete opposite. We're bombarded daily with images of people drinking and enjoying it. um, And it's false and you have to see through it. Um, So the next one... um, self-care when making the decision to quit after your book and including attention to diet and watching sugar intake um so i think i've kind of touched on that anyway obviously there's diet and fitness explained as well which kind of goes in more into the diet and fitness side of things but i mean that's only really if you're particularly interested in analyzing diet and hunger and what makes you eat and how to control eating um so i think with that one um, I'm not particularly, <laughs> I'm not particularly big on all the other self care stuff. But actually, there's another question here which I might as well jump onto, which I think kind of feeds into this. Um, if I can find it here, so someone says, we all know that your recovery approach is based on powerful messages of your books. However, the journey is long and might also require regular sessions, self help groups, etc. Would you consider this Facebook group as a proper self help group, or would you recommend something else? We could all work to make this group better, maybe with a moderator, etc. I'm just sharing ideas here. So the group is moderated. So I'm a moderator and there's a few other people who moderate as well. Um, Thank you, Dawn, for doing that, by the way. Um, And so what I would say is if you so obviously I do the books and only the books. I don't do any sort of one to one or anything. So I just don't have the time for it. Um, There are places where you can go for proper one-to-one sober coaching if that's what you want Um, and Lisa and Alex of Sober Experiment so if you go to soberexperiment.co.uk Lisa and Alex approached me having read Alcohol Explained and we now do quite a lot of collaborative work together Um, so they do specifics what they call sober coaching so if you're looking for that kind of thing with a more sort of tailored approach, but with people who are familiar with Alcohol Explained and this approach, then they're probably an excellent place to start. Um, I suppose I do consider the Facebook group to be a self-help group in that it's a group for people who follow this kind of approach and who it gels with fairly well to sort of touch base and raise issues and discuss things. Um, I know in the group somebody has set up... Um, like weekly Zoom calls, which I think is absolutely fantastic and I'd love to dial into them, but they're in the US and the timing don't really tie up with the UK. Um, I think it's like it ends up being midnight in the UK and I'm sort of had half my night's sleep by then these days. Um, But if anyone wanted to set that up in the UK or to do some different timings, I think that would be excellent as well. Um, One of the other questions I thought was good as well, and just check the time in case I go on too long. 
alcohol and being a parent because I think that's a really interesting one and I heard the other day someone saying how on earth do you do parenting particularly in lockdown when you're not drinking so you don't have that alcohol release at the end of the day and I suppose it's because I've been sober for so long now I've kind of come out the other side I don't know if anyone used to smoke and quit smoking and now looks back on it and think how on earth did I used to think that I needed to do that but you do a similar thing with alcohol and I would just remember thinking I genuinely don't understand how people can parent and drink because so I've got a seven and a nine year old and, and the two things you need with children are patience and energy okay alcohol robs you of that you don't sleep properly and it increases your heart rate and makes you feel tired all the time I genuinely do not understand how people can be a parent <coughs> um, and drink alcohol because uh, that feeling of waking up and I forget having an actual hangover, but just having a few glasses and wake, you know, tossing and turning all night, not sleeping properly and then waking up feeling tired. I can't imagine having to face a seven and a nine year old for a whole day at home and work when you've done that the night before. I genuinely can't understand it. And all for the pleasure of just a couple of hours in the evening, withdrawing, um, relieving all the misery that you caused by the previous drinks. So again, I think you just really need to rethink things. If you stop drinking for just two or three weeks, you'll be sleeping properly. Your heart rate will go down, which means you feel more alive and more energetic. Um, and parenting will be, you'll be far better anyway, because you won't be so short tempered. And I don't care how energetic and how... Um, even tempered you think you are now if you are drinking it is not as energetic or te even tempered as you would be if you quit um and actually for me it's the difference between enjoying parent enjoying parenting or well, most of it um and actually struggling through it because when i was drinking i used to find it hard and unpleasant work being a dad to be quite honest um, and since having stopped i actually enjoy most of it and i completely appreciate seven Sorry, just had a call going. Um, they are a bit of a handful and they're probably not as difficult as when they're sort of two or three years old. But even so, it's quite hard work. Um, so move on to the next point. Um, someone's put how to keep folks engaged in your books. We get good ideas from you, but the books become dust collectors or just occupy space on a shelf. The importance of rereading the parts that make the most sense. Um, I suppose that's a personal thing. I kind of always intended that Alcohol Explained and Alcohol Explained 2 would be less of a program see one of the things I struggled with with AA was having to go to all the meetings when I was in a full-time job I had young kids it was just incredibly hard feeling finding the time and I appreciate what people in AA will say is everything flows from your sobriety so so you've got to prioritize that but for me if you can have a method where you don't have to regularly maintain it that's what I was aiming for and that's what I was hope, hoping to search for um, so what for me it was about was a complete and utter change in mindset. So obviously I'm still involved in this sort of thing, but for me it was about completely changing your mindset so that you just have no more desire to smoke, being on the guard against things like fading effect bias and ambition, the things that further down the line sort of erode your sobriety, but then just getting on with life um, and not having to you know, be in recovery or work at your recovery. Actually, you've quit drinking, you've solved your problem, and now you go on and enjoy life without having to constantly be working at something. Um, so I think if you are struggling a bit, it might be worth going back to the books. And don't forget, there's not just Alcohol Explained and Alcohol Explained 2 out there. There's a whole world of quit lit out there now. There's all sorts of different things, and it's worth probably um, having a read round things a bit. Um, so I'll just have a look and see where we've got to. Um, so one of them's here. Hi, William. I'm after ways to help trigger times. For example, today I had a great day, day 32, alcohol-free, brilliant. Um, but I've gotten up to four months before alcohol-free, so I know I can do it. Um, and then it goes on, they received an email which has irritated them, which is, I mean, I'm probably belittling it slightly. Um, so they've had a particularly unpleasant email that's really rubbed them up the wrong way. So how do you switch off and stop obsessing about wine, my former drink of cho choice? So there's two questions there. How do you switch off from it? Um, 
and how do you stop obsessing with wine? How you switch off about it is probably not something I can tell you, to be honest, because I can say, you know, I exercise, I read books, I try and relax, but sometimes things do get under your skin and that is just not good enough. Sometimes you need to suffer things. Um, Don't forget, when you regularly go through aggravation, you become more resilient to it. Now, there's there's psychological studies that have been done to show this. People that hide away from their emotions and try and anaesthetise them become in increasingly weaker mentally and those that are constantly being bombarded by aggravation trying to tend to become stronger mentally it's like a muscle you use it and it gets stronger um so that's that aspect but what i can say about is obsessing with wine so don't forget if you are so where are you now you're day 32 you'll have no physical withdrawal how alcohol works is because it makes a withdrawal an unpleasant and anxious feeling, that withdrawal sits on top of whatever stress you're suffering anyway. So when you have a drink, the drink will remove the withdrawal stress. Okay, It won't do anything about the actual real aggravation, which will still be there. Okay, So for the drinker, they don't appreciate that the overall stress is partly real stress and partly aggravation. All they know is that when they have a drink, they feel a lot better. Now, you here don't have any um, withdrawal here at day 32. So having a drink will... So you're upset, angry and annoyed, OK? Having a drink will feel, like, leave you feeling slightly dulled and uncoordinated, still upset, angry and annoyed, and probably really, really upset and ashamed of yourself for starting drinking again okay so it's not going to do anything for you at all other than make things worse not even temporarily okay um and look at it from another point of view as well if someone has upset you how is destroying yourself going to get back at them okay it's not going to don't cut your nose off to spite your face it's going to do absolutely nothing to get the situation back other than destroy you, which is going to make things even worse. Um, Someone's asked, what do you think about these projects coming out claiming to reduce hangovers um, by reducing GABA rebound response? Um, I don't want to try them 65 days sober here, but curious as to your thoughts. So I don't know a huge amount about these. There's probably all different types. I know that some of them are just, you know, ridiculous things like this particular plant extract that has some myth around it you know making you feel more relaxed or easing nausea or whatever so they probably don't work anyway um point two is don't forget that there's a simple chemical thing going on in your brain when you drink alcohol is a depressant and your brain seeks to counter that and when the alcohol wears off you're left leaving overly anxious Um, i don't know how anything can change that other than some of the very powerful drugs doctors have to relieve the withdrawal symptoms in chronic long-term heavy drinkers. Um, And the third point, I suppose, is I didn't ever really get hangovers um, anyway, so I kind of feel rubbish the next day, but I was never like vomiting or feeling sick or headaches or anything. And I think, to be honest, that was one of the problems because I could almost just drink as much as I wanted to. Um, and never worry about being hungover. So I don't necessarily think that getting rid of hangovers is a good thing anyway. I think if you do struggle with your drinking, if you can find a way to get rid of hangovers, you're probably making the situation 20 times worse. Um, Someone's put, do you believe setting a quick date is helpful? I wake up every morning saying not tonight, but by the time work gets out, I've already caved and decided to drink again due to one excuse or another. Just trying to find a way to get started again. So there's a few points here. Firstly, have a look on the website because I did a blog post on exactly this. Um, And yes, I do think setting a quick date can be helpful with some caveats. So if you are stuck in the rut of wake up, feel rubbish, vow not to drink and then drink in the evening. okay, your vow to drink means nothing. And you know you're going to break it when you're making it. okay? because nothing is changing. You're waking up. You're vowing not to drink. You go through the day and you go home and drink. It's like, it's just meaningless, okay? And you just keep going through that same process over and over again. So you need to do some work to break it. And I think sometimes setting a date, a quit, um, a quit date is helpful because I think when you're in that, it, when you're in that wake up, feel rubbish, drink, 
what you're doing is you're kind of looking at it the wrong way because you say to yourself in the morning, I'm not going to drink. Um, and then you're spending the whole rest of the day not drinking, you're, you're not drinking, and then you're thinking about what it will be like to drink. So by the time you get to the evening, you think, oh, a drink will make you feel better. So you sit down and have a drink. You probably put the TV on or whatever and just ignore life and just sit there and vegetate in front of the TV. So what you're doing is your firstly your version, your your interpretation of reality of sobriety is just that anxious, horrible feeling you got from the night before. So it's not a particularly good advertisement for um, sobriety anyway. And secondly, you're ignoring the drinking because you're just vegetating in front of the TV, but you're really thinking all the time about alcohol when you're within the withdrawal process. So setting a quit date can be a very good way of doing it because if you give yourself a few nights where you're just going to drink normally without making any attempt to quit, you can start looking at it the other way around. So if you say, right, I'm going to drink for five days, but on the fifth day, that is my last day, I'm done. There's a few things it will do there. Firstly, it will change the dynamic a bit. So you've actually built up to something and you're going to quit at a certain time rather than just day after day after day. So you're sort of preparing yourself to it. Um, secondly, during those five days, and this is crucial, every minute of the day, you need to be looking at yourself and thinking how you feel and how you would be feeling if you weren't drinking. Because what we often do is we drink we stop drinking and we fantasise about drinking. Now, everyone knows when you fantasise about something, you look at only the good parts. You look at only the very best bit of it. It's not real. It's a fantasy. So what you're doing is you're quitting all day, fantasising about drinking, and then you're drinking all night. OK, so you need to change the dynamic. You need to be drinking OK, and fantasising about sobriety. And the beauty of this is it doesn't need to be a fantasy. It can be a reality. So your day will start probably three or four in the morning when you wake up with insomnia because you've been drinking. So that's your first bit. How what would I be doing now if I hadn't been drinking? I'd be fast asleep, getting deep and restful sleep. OK, fine. You get up in the morning, you feel tired, maybe a bit sick, anxious, miserable. How would you be feeling if you weren't drinking? If you'd stopped drinking for, say, three weeks or a month? You'd be feeling rested, fairly positive, ready to start the day and do that throughout the entire day and crucially continue to do it. So if of an evening you sit down and stick the TV on, sit and drink, but do not have the TV on. Don't have the radio. Don't have a book. Try and drink on your own if you can and really concentrate on the whole thing. So you will get a boost from the alcohol, but the vast majority of that will be because it's anaesthetising the um, depressed the, the, the overstimulation caused by the previous drinking okay so recognize that when you're drinking and then start to really analyze what apart from that you're getting out of it and what you will find is <coughs> you're feeling slightly tunnel vision slightly disorientated and slightly dull it's not a particularly pleasant feeling okay and you go through the evening and the more you drink the more sort of disorientated and confused you'll feel and then you'll feel tired and then you'll go to bed and then you wake up again and you do it again. If you do five days of that and then hit your point when you will stop. And again, you do need to bear in mind there will be a you won't go straight into feeling much better. You will find that you've got some momentum to actually make that date stick and to stick with it. OK, go on to the website as well. It's in Alcohol Explained too, but it's also on the website on how long it takes to feel better. And that takes you through what you can expect when you stop drinking so you will have a day or two of anxiety and probably less sleep than you got when you're drinking then you'll have maybe a week or two where you feel really tired and drained and then when you come out the other side of that you'll feel better than you have done since you started drinking even when you're sat down of an evening having that first glass of wine or whatever it is of the evening OK, and that's what you need to do. So you change the dynamic instead of quitting drinking and fantasizing about drinking. You drink and you think about what you would be like if you weren't drinking. Um, so another one here. So this is an interesting one. I'll just see what the time is. I'm probably dragging on a bit longer than I intended to here. But this one. So I found all your previous talks really helpful. Thank you so much for sharing them. Some questions I have are how to cope when your partner is drinking. Do you walk away, occupy yourself doing something else? What do you do with the frustration of it? Um, oh. In essence, how to navigate a relationship when one drinks and one doesn't. Um, so goes on to ask about triggers, which I think I've already 
dealt with. But I'll, actually, I'll, let me talk about this point first. So relationships. If a relationship is built on alcohol, then absent the alcohol, you've got two situations. You've got a relationship where the two people have nothing in common and it's going to end. Or you have a relationship where actually there is enough in common for it to carry on. Um, I'm not an expert on relationships at all, but that's how I see it. Um, so I would say you need to try and find that common ground when not drinking. Now, it's slightly different if you've got one person drinking and one doesn't, because for all our great ideas about drinking being cool and sophisticated, actually, when you're sober and you look at someone drinking, it's fairly repulsive most of the time. Um, their eyes tend to glaze over. They become annoying. They become I, I kind of think of them as being like toddlers, sort of spoiled children. They become very overly emotional, very self-centered. They don't listen. They only want to talk. Um, so it can be very difficult. And to be honest, I don't have an answer. I've not experienced it um, and I don't really have an answer to it. Um, so I don't know what to suggest. I mean, if it's a, if someone drinking very heavily, you could and this actually happens quite a lot. I think if you quit drinking and you're clearly enjoying life, a lot of people who you would think aren't necessarily questioning their drinking turns out they are. And they will start having conversations with you about, oh, how did you quit? How is it? And they're kind of like tentatively feeling their way about, hang on, is it possible for me to quit alcohol and still enjoy life? So there might be that aspect. You might be able to talk to your partner um, and see if there's a way you can kind of tempt them in. Um, but other than that, I don't have a massive amount to add to that, I'm afraid. As I say, I'm not really an expert on relationships. Um, so... The other thing that raised here, if you could talk a bit about triggers and what you suggest about playing it in your mind to the end, seems like this requires some imagination. While part of your brain is saying drink, you have said it's good to have a plan for these times. Are there other ways you've found for dealing with cravings besides exercise, reading, watching TV? Right, so just to clarify here, exercise, reading and watching TV isn't ways to deal with cravings. OK, their ways and, and it's it, maybe it's a bit of a sucker point. Their ways to deal with the stresses and strains of everyday life, which everybody drinkers and non drinkers have. OK, when you hit a bump in the road, a bad patch, you need to have something in place that doesn't involve reaching for a drink. So a lot of people, they wake up, they've had too much to drink. They've been doing it for months and months and they want to quit. So they quit. But the problem is when something bad happens, their natural reaction is to reach for a drink and they need something to help them cope with that. So you need that coping mechanism. OK, so that's the exercise, the reading, the meditation, the yoga, whatever it is. Dealing with cravings, um, that is about playing things through and the reality. OK, and when people say play it through to the end, what they usually say is think about waking up feeling rubbish. OK, but I always say you don't play it through just to that bit. Play it through immediately. OK, because people who have made a commitment to stop drinking, usually it's because their drinking has got out of hand and it's becoming a problem. OK, if they then start drinking again, the immediate thing you're going to get is a feeling of guilt and failure. OK. Even before the alcohol hits your bloodstream, you're going to be feeling even more miserable because you've you've been drinking. OK, even when the anaesthetizing effect kicks in, if you're anything over a week or so, you haven't got any withdrawal to relieve. So you'll be left feeling guilty and miserable, slightly tunnel vision, dazed and confused. And you'll have the event that you were hoping to deal with in the first place anyway. OK. That alcohol will then wear off, leaving you feeling anxious, and then you'll need to have another drink. And of course, the more you drink, the more you anaesthetize those parts of your brain that regulate emotion. So your emotions will start to run unchecked. So if it's something that happened, like the lady there who said about the email that made her really angry, you will become more and more angry as the evening wears on. Alcohol, don't just play it through to the morning. Think of the reality of that drink, because the reality isn't you pouring a glass of wine and sitting there and suddenly everything's OK and you're sat there happy as Larry smirking to yourself for the whole rest of the evening. That's not how it goes. OK, it would be lovely if there was something that could miraculously take away all your problems. OK, but for most people, there isn't anything. You just need to get on and deal with life. So 
one way of looking at it is you've already got your boost. OK, if things are feeling really rough and you feel like you need a boost, just think to yourself, I'm already feeling better because I'm not drinking. OK, I don't have weeks of rubbish sleep and accumulated anxiety lying on top of everything. I don't have all the lethargy and the self-loathing and the loss of self-control that goes with drinking you've already got that massive boost and then think about whatever it is you can do i.e you know going for a run or whatever sometimes there is nothing you can do and as i say don't forget if you if it is really bad and you're just sat there suffering it at least you are becoming more mentally resilient because when we go through tough times that's when it makes us mentally more resilient um and i think the last question what's your go-to drink when you are out what's what way do you treat yourself um so i don't i don't, <laughs> i don't really go out at the moment anyway even before lockdown um i kind of i do sort of like alcohol free beers and stuff so um but also i've kind of gone off them a bit recently and i kind of simple things like just lime and soda or something um but ways of treating yourself i think that's a good one because there's loads of different ways you can treat yourself um, and it doesn't need to be massive things. It can just be little things that put a smile on your face, like messaging someone or um, something like that. Anyway, I hope that was useful for everyone. Um, and I will try and do one the following week. So I'll be posting in the group again on Thursday morning um, to ask for more comments and suggestions. Um, sorry if you're asking questions when I'm actually on, but for some reason you can't do a laptop um, post into Facebook which is a bit irritating um, so you've got to do it on your phone and it's just too difficult trying to look at questions so if you do have questions please look out for the Thursday post and put them in there um, thanks everyone have a good weekend see you next week